Wonderful. Right, so in two minutes you're going to hear some music and then I will introduce the show and then I'm going to play a video and then we're going to go into the show. All right, just so that you know what's um, going to happen. The minutes are going so slowly. Now, can you see my screen, guys? Can you see my screen if you just say yes or no? Right, okay. Take this away. Take this away. How are we doing today? I just want to welcome you to Conversations with Yvonne Michelle. Now, this show is a little bit different from any other show that I have done before. 
because we have never ever been in this situation we've been in situations similar but we've never been in this place before so i'm just going to there we go guys can you hear me i want to just make sure that everybody on the panel can hear me this evening okay so i'm just going to do this so that we don't we can keep the feedback to minimum. So those of you who have headphones, if you can use your headphones, it'd be great. If not, oh, still okay. Okay, guys. So can everybody hear me? You can hear me? Great. Okay, so today's show is um, a show. Um, this has been streamed straight, straight through to Facebook while we are here. So we have a panel um, of people who are in our community, who work in the community, and are people facing who are making an impact in communities all over the country. Um, today, we are recognizing that many young people, many people, many black people have died in police custody. Many people have died um, at the hands of the police and there's lots of racism going on in the world as well as in our local areas. So today we wanna have an open and a frank conversation about what has been happening and how we find the solutions to this. Now we've got some really good people on our panel tonight. Um, we've got Montel Nouvelle who I consider to be an expert on um, stop and search and um, it's one of the things that I really wanted to highlight. So Montel, what I am going to be asking you for is some tips for um, the people who are listening as well as to what the procedure is in stop and search as well so that they know how to behave, what to look for, the rights that they have. So I'm just going to, I know you know that already, so, but we're going to be coming to you on that. Um, Sure. Um, so, so we're going to come. To, I'm going to introduce everybody. I'm just going to just let everybody know who everybody is. We also have Denise Richards, who uh, was pivotal um, in um, in the campaign. She was um, in the campaign, the Stephen Lawrence campaign. She was involved in that. Um, I've seen Denise on the news all over since the 25th of May. So Denise has got a lot to contribute. We've got. Um, We've got our friend here. Um, we've got Sarah Owen, who is an MP for Luton North as well. So we've got Halima, we've, we've got loads of people here. So what I'm going to do is, basically, is I'm going to get you to each have a two minutes to just introduce yourself, what you do, um, or where you are active in, and then we're going to go straight in. Well, I'm going to show the peaceful... Um, demonstration that we had in Luton and then we're going to go straight into the conversation. So I want to welcome everybody here today um, on the panel and you're going to introduce yourselves to just to make it easier uh, tell us what you are doing in the communities in and around. So I'm going to I'm going to go I'm going to start at the end so I'm going to go to I'm going to come to Halima first and I'm going to go to Glenn and then we'll go round. Okay let unmute you hi halima how are you doing i am good how are you i'm very well thank you Can thank you for inviting me today that's wonderful no worries no worries well thank you for being here so just tell um, us a little bit about who you are and what you do yeah so just a bit about myself. so i'm a pred predominantly a youth worker um so i'm in like schools people are units um i'm you know, quite passionate about advocating for young young people, but I'm also an artist as well. Um, so I use art workshops um, and events to kind of inspire social change. Um, so that includes you know, doing uh, my project called 22 Seconds to Murder, which was around kind of uh, raising awareness around knife crime. Um, I've got a project around kind of um, helping gang postcode wars. Um, I'm also um, in the Stop and Search scrutiny panel, which Montel, I'm sure, will tell you more about. Um, also, a member of different things. So, apart from you know the scrutiny panel, um, also Luton Sports Network, um, Uprising uh, Leadership, and most recent NGYT um, Young People's Board. Um, so, for me, it's you know I'm passionate about using art um, and uh, as a form 
um, essentially. So my FC, you know, do kind of art exhibitions. Um, they've actually been featured on BBC New News as well. Um, so I'll have kind of performances, um, art and discussions kind of taking place. Um, so I'm very kind of politically um, active as well. I do, you know, do a lot of community work. Okay, you seem to be frozen. So thank oh, you for- um, oh. and, and yeah. Well, you just froze a little bit there, Halima, so I thought I'd just jump in. Thank you so much oh, for letting us know who you are and what you do. I'm going to jump up. To, I'm going to introduce the ladies first, guys. I'm just going to do it that way. So, Sarah, um, just jump in and just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Thanks, Yvonne, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, my name's Sarah Owen. I'm the MP for Luton North. I was elected in December, and it's fair to say that this isn't how I imagined the first few months of um, being an elected representative to look like. Um, I had my baby in February just before COVID hit um, and since then I think it has pretty much dominated every piece of work um, from terms from casework through to what I focus on. I, I was a care worker in the community um, going into people's homes but I'd also worked on hospital wards as well and so health was always going to be a big driver for me personally as to why I wanted to get involved in politics. And health inequalities have always existed. But I think that this um, crisis that we're seeing with COVID-19 in particular has shun a light that no one can hide from about the deep rooted inequalities that we're seeing in terms of housing and health particularly for deprived and for our black and Asian minority ethnic communities and as, as well. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the discussion tonight um, and to also um, to also listen and to learn and to represent, which is exactly what an MP should be doing in, in my view. Lovely. Thank you so much for, for coming and being a part of this open conversation and giving up your time. So thank you very much. Um, Denise Richards, are you there? Okay, let's bring Denise on. Unmute yourself. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Hi, so I'm Denise, um, based here in South Derbyshire. Um, I'll just give it just really brief. I'll just say I'll start from campaigning. That's like my main thing. Um, so I work with Simone de Banyar. And we, we uh, raised the funds for the uh, private criminal prosecution for the Stephen Lawrence case. So that was where I think was my sort of first introduction into campaigning and fundraising. Um, uh, that has developed into lots of other things in terms of developing, uh, and developing services for young people. So I develop services for organisations that accommodate young people around training and um, education, etc., cetera, and employment. Um, that's another side thing. Um, then I got involved with Stop and Search. So I was the chair for Brent Stop and Search Monitoring Group um, in Brent, along with uh, Roy Crosdale. And um, we did some really good things. And one in particular is that when we, um, we challenged, um, it was then that Theresa May then was the Home Secretary, and they were doing a survey to understand how, what people thought about Stop and Search and the changes. And we were able to get that survey pulled. We were able to get um, questions designed to involve young people in that questionnaire that went out. So that was really good that we were able to do that. Um, from then, I have just continued to be very involved in matters that are linked to equality of our people. And um, I led the campaign on Sunday in Derby for um, Black Lives Matter. So we had a really big campaign on Sunday. We had 1,800 people there and um, it was a really good turnout. So I'm now from that, the amount of, what was really amazing was the amount of young people that attended. We took, a, we took the knee for eight minutes and 40 something seconds and the young people were absolutely amazing. And out of that, we're now trying to see how we can now move forward in terms of um, raising awareness with, uh, with Derby City Council, shall we say, and with the police, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where I'm at right now, moving, moving those things forward, so that's me. Wonderful, thank you, Denise. We'll come back to you a little bit later. I'm gonna move over now to, and introduce, ask the gentleman to introduce himself. So I'm gonna come over, I'm gonna go over to David, because uh, David, we haven't spoke about David yet. So I'm just gonna unmute you.
There we go. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you, David. Good evening, everyone. I'm David Michael. I grew up and went to secondary school in Luton before going to London to join the Metropolitan Police, where I served for 30 years as a veteran. I was involved in setting up the first black police association in, in the country, and I was chair of it for um, twice. I was very outspoken about police racism while I was a serving officer. And um, I was very comfortable um, talking about police racism in the national on national press media. Um, it was very uncomfortable for many people, but I knew it was part of the way I was upholding the law, upholding uh, and basically doing what I signed up in the police to do. Um, since I retired from the police, mm -hmm. I've been involved in community police engagement. Um, Lewisham in London was my borough, so I was for a number of years and I chaired community police engagement group, including stop and search. And because I had the inside track of how policing works, I think I was able to do quite a lot that even the best equipped and the best meaning community people who don't have the inside track can do. So sometimes I was able to, to press and push police borough commanders and if necessary, um, press the levers at Scotland Yard um, to get fair and just policing. Mm -hmm. I was also involved in setting up the first independent, the first race independent police advisory group at Scotland Yard in the middle of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry. I, um, of my own volition, without anybody asking, I um, um, did a lot of support to the Stephen Lawrence family during the inquiry, before the inquiry and since. And, um, also, I've 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 worked as a uh, a legal representative, um, fully accredited by what was the Legal Services Commission, defending suspects in custody at police stations. I was a, an elected councillor, and part of my brief was safer, stronger communities. Brilliant. And I um, yes, yeah, so. I'm no longer a councillor, I'm no longer a police officer, um, but um, I've gained such trust and confidence from members of the community in London and beyond in the country that I still get a good amount of casework and people okay. needing support. Wonderful. So, Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much for your introduction. I'm going to move down to Glenn now. Um, Glenn is a community activist. Would you like to come in, Glenn? Let's unmute you. You're, you're muted. You might try. That's it. Go for it. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Hello. Um, yeah, no, my, my name is Glenn Jenkins. I'm a, <clears throat> I was born and bred in Luton here. And um, my background is from what you call sound system culture originally uh, where we i'm part of a sound system called exodus collective which is basically in the in the early 90s it was like a large group of multicultural unemployed long-term unemployed people from luton in the last kind of big recession if you like and we, we all eventually got ourselves together and started occupying local farms barns warehouses you know disused properties of which there were many around Luton. Montel will remember these days. And um, what that did, that it, was, it ended up with an eight year campaign of civil disobedience, in the, which was eventually we secured a legal finish to it and an arrangement. So it was a 
And the thing is, with civil disobedience, particularly when it's a multicultural group, it brought us into a lot of creative conflict with the authorities because we're talking five, 10,000 people convoying through the town. That's, you know what I mean? It's a big thing, yeah. And um, it was causing loss of profits from pubs and all sorts of angles that made basically for a lot of angry people with a lot of power. And what you learn, what I learned through that was particularly the attitude of the police against what they would see as non-conformity to authority and particularly the attitude to the police of black people who are non-conformist to authority. And the difference was tangible in the way I would be treated, for example, as a white man, and my comrades would be treated who are black people. For example, they planted drugs on us and it all came to light, but they chose the black man because they saw that as a more believable target for the public. And I think this kind of racist, stereotypical view that, that encouraged them to think, well, pick him, not him, is, is at the core of what's happening now. And, I, and just to finish, on my, I, I now do, in my current lifestyle, it's the same thing. It's not-for-profit community development from the bottom up in Marsh Farm. And Marsh Farm, recently, we've had two black people killed in police custody in the last four years from Marsh Farm, the one estate that I live on. Most people know about one of them, Leon Briggs. Leon Briggs, I'm part of the J4L Justice for Leon campaign. And the other guy, Ismail, not many people knew about him because he wasn't didn't have a big friend space. He just moved in, etc. But two people in the space of four years, five years. And you know what? That was an experience for the whole town because Justice for Leon is a long awaited development that's nowhere near. In fact, we got gross injustice, didn't we, Yvonne, for Leon? Absolutely. So I've got, <clears throat> I've got what you could call a white man's perspective at the front line of seeing how black people can be treated when you don't conform. But not for a minute do I ever try to pretend that without being black, you could understand that, you could overstand that. I can have an understanding, but the overstanding is t to be black in Britain. So that's my, my overall perspective. And I, I do community development in Marsh Farm now, as I say, where we've lost two people to, um, to police custody, mystery deaths. And there's an everyday ongoing thing in Luton where the campaign for justice for Leon and for, you know, for black people generally is something I'm, I'm honoured to have been part of for 20, 30 years. And, and, and I think we're living in times now where at last this issue is coming to a head and it's going to be properly dealt with. Absolutely. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. And last but by no means least, let's hear from Montel, Montel Novell, who is, um, works very closely in Stop and Search, has got a lot of knowledge. So jump on Montel. Unmute yourself. Um, there we go. Oh, go for it again. Try again one more time. Unmute yourself. That's it. Hi. Great. Loud and clear. So about Montel Neville. Um, hello, Glenn. Hello, David. Um, I've been a social um, activist for around about 20 years. For the past 10 years, I've been a trainer. I run training workshops in a whole range of topics. My three main target groups, one, people who work in local government, two, young people, and three, people who work in policing. Um, I've, I've delivered training to around about well over a thousand police officers and, and armed police staff. Um, the other things I do in terms of trying to educate and ensure that the police re reflect the values that we need them to reflect. I take part in police recruitment. I've interviewed over 140 people to become police officers on the one hand. And on the other hand, I sit on a panel whereby I'm an advisor um, on the code of ethics to the uh, professional standards panel. And that panel looks into police disciplinary issues. 
And you mentioned earlier, I'm also the chair of Bedfordshire Dolphin Search um, um, Community Scrutiny Panel. Now, the Community Scrutiny Panel, I've got round about 50 people involved from all over Bedfordshire. It is a critical friend, as the police will tell you. It does give them a hard time, but it gives them a hard time for a reason, because there are issues, and they know there's issues. It's um, widely regarded and respected that absolutely there are things that need to be done better. It's interesting, my friend Glenn mentioned the word conform, and we'll talk more about stuff and shit in more detail uh, later on. I find the biggest issue is not even whether people are conforming or not. There are still problems and attitudes to the way they are treated. So it's not just about if they are, if they do conform. Thank you, Montel, for coming in with that. So I want to welcome every one of you onto the show tonight. I really, really appreciate you giving up your time. We do have, um, we are live streaming to Facebook as well. And so there will be some questions from our Facebook listeners as well as the www. Now, um, what I had it planned was to play, was to share and play this. This was part of a protest that we saw on Saturday. And then we're gonna take the conversation from there. And I'm glad that we have people who are working with young people, um, also who are working with the police, so we can kind of get a bit of a balance. And then we've also got Sarah here, who's, who's talking from an MP's perspective on how we move forward. Now, one of the things, one of the reasons why I decided to do this show is because we have had protests. We've had a lot of people say a lot of things on social media. People are very angry and rightfully so. But my question is, is how do we move forward from this? What is the solutions to this? Because we can go round in circles and we know what's been happening. We know that this has been going on for years and years and years. But now we've come to the place where we've hit the brick wall for real. And as Glenn has said, now is, now is the time. We have an opportunity here right now to start putting things into place, to start um, brainstorming as to how we move forward and how we create a different world for our young people. Because I know what I've experienced and I, I guess everybody here has experienced something along the way in terms of racism or harsh treatment by the police or what have you, whatever it is, now is the time for solution. Now is the time for us to put our heads together and really work out a plan that's gonna work for our children that are coming up. Now, I have a four-year-old grandson, believe it or not, I do. I know I look young, but I have a four-year-old grandson. This is not the world that I want for him. And my grandson is mixed race. He's a mixed parent um, child. And I don't want him, I want him to be able to live a, a carefree life where he can walk down the road and not be pulled or stopped because of the colour of his skin, right? So now the, the buck stops with us. We have to make the change. We have to put the things in place. As the elders, we have to take responsibility. So I'm just going to play this. I'm not sure if, how it's going to work, but I'm going to give it a go. Right, here we go. So this was a clip from the peaceful protest on Saturday in Luton. I can't see that, Yvonne.
Yvonne, I can't see anything. Can any, can everybody else see something? No, not seeing right. anything. Okay, guys, did you hear any of that? A little bit. Okay, I think the guys on Facebook probably and on the WW would have heard it more. But basically, through the campaign, they were basically saying that black lives matter. We are not making any excuses. We don't want to hear about all life. We're not even having that conversation today because this isn't about everybody else. This is about what happens to black people. Um, this is what happens to black people in general. So um, I'm going to swing over now because ooh, I've lost one. Oh, no, I've lost somebody, but they'll be back. They'll be back. There we go. Okay, so as you could hear, or maybe not, there was so much passion on Saturday and we saw so many young people out walking, protesting because the, the young people have had enough, much less the elders. So my thing is now is how we know that racism exists. We know this. We know that it's institutionalized. We know that it's in, in many, many, many organizations. Now, my thing is, how do we change that? How do we start to change the minds of those people who are racist? Because right now, it, we're calling you out. We're calling you out. So this panel here is a diverse panel and, it's, and it was strategically put together because I wanna know from each walk of life, what you think will make the difference we, and again, I'm going to say we already know what's happened and we have to, I heard somebody say that they refuse to see George Floyd as a martyr. Now, what I will say is George Floyd is the tip of the iceberg. If you think about an iceberg with the tip, underneath it is huge and it goes underwater. Yeah, that's how an iceberg is. So all the things, you might be able to see that tip, but there's a big density underneath that water that no one can see that's been rippling for years. So now we are in the position as to how we move forward. So I'm gonna just throw it out, whoever wants to come in first with your expertise. Um, I was gonna go, I was gonna actually come to you first um, Montel, because I know that you have some quality information, especially for those um, young people who do get stopped. What are their rights? What are they supposed to say when they are stopped? So let's jump in with you first, I think, and then we're gonna open up and guys, you know, if there's something that you hear, if you're on the Facebook and you see a, uh, a message or a comment that you want to answer, then by all means, jump in. This is an open forum for us um, to all speak and have our voices heard. So Montel, come in. You're on mute. Can you hear me? I can. Excellent, okay. Thank you. Um, I think I'd like to start off by just putting everything into context because I think that's really important. Every single person I talk to and I speak to um, all agree that it's important to take knives or drugs off the streets. However, my problem is, number one, the fine rate is really low. Very, very few knives or friendship weapons or even drugs are found through the use of stop and search powers. Number two, the amount of people who are black or mixed race who are disproportionately stopped and searched is far too high. Now that for me is a problem, but I've got a third problem. And the third problem is there are a lot of people who don't see it as a problem. And they don't see it as a problem because it doesn't affect them. Maybe they come from a central bedroom in a middle class background or something. So when you've got large numbers of mixed race and um, young black men, mainly black men, who are stuck from shit, um, it doesn't bother them. I think it should bother them. So I'd like to put that into one perspective. Um, one of the things that we do is we monitor 
the stats, but we also look at body worn videos. And we do ask all officers to ensure that they're, with, that they're using their body worn videos. So, my first advice to everybody is the moment you are approached by a police officer, look out for the body worn video and ensure the camera is turned on. You'll know it's turned on because it would have a red light flashing on it. If it's not turned on, tell them to turn it on, number one. Number two, you or your friends are allowed to record it on your mobile phone to ensure that you record the incident. If you feel that you are unfairly stopped and searched, make a complaint. Lots of people raise issues, but very few complaints actually come in. Somewhere between two and five complaints come in per year. Now, what should an officer tell you? First of all, they should tell you the grounds of why they stopped to you. Second, the object that they are looking for, and they must be exact. For example, they're stopping you, the grounds are they've received a report, they're looking for a stolen mobile phone, as an example. Um, if they're not in uniform, they must show you a warrant card. They must tell you their name and PC123, the number and the station. I'm attached to Luton Police Station or Kempston Police Station. They must tell you what law that they are using. I'm stopping and shit to you under the Misuse of Drugs Act. Um, and then they must tell you that you are detained for the purpose of a stop and search. And after the encounter, they must give you a receipt. The stop and search must be proportionate. So if um, it's a small item and you don't have any badge on you, it might take five minutes. We don't expect it to take half an hour for you to be detained for half an hour. If they are still detaining you when the stop and search has been completed, we would want to know why. They should allow you to go at that time. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Montel. I hope that those people who are listening at home made those notes as to, um, Montel, do you have like a, a tick sheet or of some kind that, that yes. could, we could put on onto social media and stuff so that people have actually got, that. could you send that over to me? After the program. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for that. Okay. So we've heard that this is, um, these are the procedures now. I'm just going to just add to what Monzel's just said. Now, I have a 21-year-old daughter who um, is, she's a good girl. She's a very, very good girl, right? But lately, she's been showing me video after video after video after video of young black men being stopped. And those procedures that you've just listed are not being adhered to. So how do we now, as the public, how do we have a say? How do we change what's going on? Because we know what's supposed to happen, but we know that it's not happening. So what happens is there's 43 police forces covering the whole country. We've obviously got Bedford Police here. Um, you have the Met Police in London, etc. So identify the name of your police force. For example, if it's Hertfordshire Police, that's number one. Number two, look for professional standards. Go straight to professional standards and make a complaint to professional standards. They are like internal affairs, anti-corruption unit, and they investigate complaints against police officers. Um, and they are the, uh, I would recommend the best place to go to. I do advise professional standards, certainly, in the cases of anything that could be to do with discrimination. Um, and if, if you send in into professional standards to your local police force, they will ensure it's investigated thoroughly. For example, okay. I also advise officer police as well. Okay. Now I'm glad that you've got the scrutiny team in, in Bedfordshire, because what I'm going to say now is this, and, it, and I'm opening this up to everybody, because even though we have the professional standards, to complain to when someone's dead is too late and we know already what has happened we know what happened prior in our history 
right? So we, and we also know, uh, and let's mention the name, we also know with Leon Briggs that the police officers have got away with murder, literally. So how now as the collective of the people, the ones who are paying the taxes, the ones who are paying all of these things that are, uh, are a part of this, Oh, that are part of uh, it's all right, Sarah. I can see as a part of this, right? It's a, a part of this. What we're going through. How do we? How do we now create change? Create change, guys. You can come in. I can. I just just can let I, yourselves go, Lou. Do you mind if I just make a quick comment? Yeah. So. Okay. Okay, let Denise come in and then you can make a comment. Denise, you were going to come in. Come in. Um, so I think, Yvonne, I, my approach is a little bit different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So if we look at it from the point of view of uh, the issues with um, Montel and I from the same, and Montel is, is still in this and is is more qualified in terms of up-to-date approaches to that around stop and search. But I, I think uh, in terms of what's happened over the weekend, uh, it's a more holistic view. Mm -hmm. So I cannot just focus on what uh, the police are doing directly because there are other factors that link into this. So, Gone are the days. What's happened previously and what we've allowed to happen is not actually getting an understanding of what is white privilege. What is white privilege? And understanding what, it, what society does in giving people uh, who are not my colour, giving them uh, power, even though they share the same, we, say we have the same political and economic circumstances, they're given extra power. The change of any change that we're talking about has to come from there because we don't hold the power. Yeah. The power to change, it does not lie with us. So when we look at it and it's systemic, it's throughout, and that's the thing, that's the word I look for, it's systemic, it's throughout every single area. So you the police don't work, they work, they work to they serve us, but they work as part of a cog. So you've got the police, you've got education, you've got health, you've got the local government. All of those all fall in and create the pot. We have to, they, and I will say, and I'm not, and I'm not going to, um, the softly, softly has got us nowhere. Um, I feel, to a certain extent, a lot of what we're experiencing is like Groundhog Day. We've been here. And we've done this journey and we're still at the same place. And I'm going to give you, read you a quote, if I can find it. I was just looking for a quote from the Black Police Association um, that they said, and I'm, oh, goodness me, you know what? How can I not find it? Um, but it, it, it refers to, give me one second. Oh, wow, I thought I had it. Oh, yeah, here it is. This one, a Black Police Association. Black Britons are grappling with the harsh reality with that decades of structural and institutional racism. You know what the word they use? It has made us, people of my colour, fodder. What is fodder? Yeah? Fodder. Fodder is something you feed to cattle. Yeah? That is what the system has done. Yeah? And basically leaves us uh, in an inferior position and it talks about the, disp the disproportional use of uh, of um, force in policing so where where we're at is that we're in a very very bad state so we can't just refer to the police you can even look at the media for example the media okay do not help our cause neither the media will come to people like myself when there are heightened stories yeah about racism about immigration 
that is what they're that's what they're interested in so over the week over the past few days following the death of of george floyd you know we are hot you know they want our story they want you on all their news channels i have actually turned some of them down i've told them no i'm not going to do your story because um i recognize why you actually want me um and i also appreciate that if another story comes in the next two or three days my story our story goes to the back burner yeah the change that we're talking about lies with those with white privilege. If they're not prepared to let us in through the front door, uh, we need to find other ways to get in. And the only way we the way that we can actually do that is stepping up our action and not taking the softly, softly. You talk about Yvonne having a grandchild of four years old. You want to do what you can, yeah, to make sure that life may not be perfect, but a lot better than it is for yourself and your daughter right now. It's something, it's a responsibility that we have. So one of the things that I think we really need is something called courage, yeah? Because it's gonna take courage, but for say, say for example, Sarah, it's gonna take courage um, for people who are of who have white privilege to actually go out and stand up for us, yeah? We need people to actually stand up for us and recognize that you have, some, you have more control over the system as black people, there's a lot that we've got to do too. We've got to fix up as well. But we are depending with the, we are very dependent to an extent on those who have that privilege to work along with us. Otherwise, we're not going to get anywhere. I'm very passionate about this. We had a rally on Derby on, sun, on Sunday. We had around about 1,500 people. And it was amazing to see the amounts of young people that, were, that actually turned up to the event. And it tells me loud and clear the work that we've got to do ensuring that going forward that things are going to be a lot better so things around like uh, boris johnson for example is talking about we look at human rights they're eroding human rights if we have a problem as black people and we're in a system where uh, human rights are go are being taken further down and down and down we're going to have a problem that is something that needs to be challenged as an example yeah um i often think about things like reparations yeah so like people not understanding that you know the amount of money that went to people who were who owned land in the caribbean africa um, and how much money they got back because slavery was abolished imagine if we got even a quarter of that what we could do yeah we need to get behind campaigns that can help us economically yeah to make change within our community those are I mean, i could go on i'm going to end it there but i feel very strongly about it i just personally feel if we talk about just the police we're not going anywhere okay uh, sarah uh, i know sarah wants to jump in sarah jump in for me thank you we'll um back. i just wanted to say i think you're 100 percent right yvonne about how we need to keep this moving that it isn't just one movement in a moment that this is about actually achieving something and what i saw on saturday in luton um particularly from the young speakers gives me hope that this is the generation that will see the change and the justice um that has been long deserved and there is something really really startling about hearing an 18 year old woman say she is sick and tired at 18 years old being sick and tired already um, is something that we should all hear and we should all act on. I don't think it's enough for politicians to be saying that Black Lives Matter. They need to act now. Um, and there are lots of ways of, of tackling it. I think um, Montel's touched on, on, on the stop and search and Denise is right. I think it's much wider than that. Um, I think we need to right the historic wrongs. Um, I think we've got to use our voices. Um, and challenge those systems and institutions as well as looking at education and if i talk about one of the things that i worked on the first thing one of the first issues i raised um on being elected and it was a promise i made to you yvonne around justice for the windrush generation when we met at the hustings and it was one of the first things i raised and i wrote to preeti patel mm -hmm. and i asked the government exactly how many people in our region in our area um had um had been rewarded any of that money from the 200 million um, pound fund that the government says that they have uh, have made available and they wouldn't tell me they wouldn't tell me and the truth is is that it's probably just a handful 
if that. Um, I'm going to continue pushing that. But even when you are supposed to be a peer, when you have been elected the same as them, it's not, it's not always the level playing field. Um, but it is, it is about righting those historic wrongs. And I think we saw one of those um, historic wrongs righted in Bristol um, during those protests. But it's also about using our voices internationally as well. So some journalist asked me why it was that George Floyd mattered um, to us in the UK. Um, and I said, because hate, because racism and um, is not a problem just for the US. It is here in the UK and you see it every single day within every system and within, with every, within every organization um, and when we as a country do have what is seen as a traditional ally we shouldn't be afraid of calling out actually and saying this is ra this is racist your policies your views the way that your leader is acting no matter how close um, a country has been to us in the past we have a moral obligation to call out racism wherever we see it in, in the world um, and in terms of systems and institutions this isn't a problem with just institutions and systems that already exist. What I'm seeing currently um, with a lot of the health issues around COVID and how their government are dealing with it, they are just replicating the same cultural biases. I sit on the Health and uh, Social Care Select Committee and in front of me I had the woman who is in charge of the new test, track, trace system. Now, given that we know that black men and women are four times more likely to die from COVID-19 than white people, I thought she would know how many black or Asian um, contact tracers she had hired, given how important it is to our diverse communities, and she couldn't tell me. She couldn't tell me. So in there is another cultural bias being replicated again yeah. and again. And it might not be necessarily intentional but it's happening and that's why it's so important to continue to keep pushing on it and that goes straight through down to how lockdown has even been enforced when you've got the met police twice as likely to find a black person than a white person so it's as if the country isn't learning from its historic wrongs which is why i say it has to learn and write those historic wrongs almost in order to be able to say that we are going to get the future right um, and that's why I think education is so important but Montel on the specific issues around um, when people I think in Luton and particularly Luton North where I represent if there are issues and people feel also uncomfortable necessarily wanting to um, go directly I'm I'm your MP I'm here to represent if there is an issue contact me contact my team um, I'm I'm, I'm always there and it can also be done anonymously as well if people just want to talk to me or want to vent or want to say something or share an experience then do so please thank you very much and i'll take you up on that um did like to come back to something which um denise said first of all 100 percent agree with everything you've said um it's not just a police issue even though it's a really important issue the reason why we focus upon the police is because they have the power, as um, Yvonne said, to perhaps even either take somebody's life or cause harm or deprive those people of their liberty. That's why that's such an important, but it's not the only issue. One issue which I've also been um, working with over the past 20 years is inequalities from the local authority. And I think it's important just to highlight to you, Sarah, every single year, the local authority does a plan. And in your plan, they talk about recruiting local people, local jobs for local people. In addition, they get grants and income for local communities, including the most deprived areas of Luton, which are the parts of Luton that got the highest numbers of the black community. What happens every single year is there's no plan to have black people, unless we absolutely blunt here, recruited and employed by Luton Borough Council in terms of especially to any mid or senior rank. 
And in the past 20 years, I've never known a single person reach those senior ranks. Number two, I'm told all the time that they don't have the skills or the qualifications. But if you go to Lee Gray train station or Lytton train station, thousands of very intelligent, skilled, professional black people get jobs outside of Luton because they're not working locally. And I think it's important to highlight that because Luton is the, one of the biggest employers in the town. So, um, and also it's got lots of power and authority. I worked in partnership with the council for a long time. And it's really important that we look closer to home at all the different organizations. Also talked about education, the way that um, black people in Luton underachieve in education is scandalous and it's not even addressed. There's no policy that drives up black people who try to um, improve um, black people who don't attain. Um, so I think there's um, the local authorities issues, there's a the general employment issues, there's only any black senior executives in any organisation in Luton, but yet there are those people who do have the skills and knowledge. You wanted to highlight those things. I'm glad you raised that because um, I was just, actually... Can I just yeah. touch on that? Yeah. You, you can, but just give me one minute. Because I, as, as I was going to play, because we're having a few technical issues um, on the other side, so I just wanted to let you know. I was going to play the, the piece where we had a news reporter asking uh, one of the members of the cabinet how many black people they yeah. have in the cabinet. <laughs> which was a very, very interesting conversation because we heard a lot of... Uh, 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 that's what we heard. Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't, and and yeah. the, the kind of the deflection <laughs> to say, oh, we've got these all these ethnic. No, be clear. We want to know how many black people you have yeah. in the cabinet. So Halima, yeah. I'm going to bring you in. Um, if if the internet, if it was working properly, I would have put, I would have played that. But as we're not we're not streaming very well tonight, um, we're going to leave that. Halima, would you like to come in and respond? Yeah. Hi. So yeah, I just wanted to touch on what Montel and what Denise said previously as well. Um, so when we look at kind of like the power structures, white power structures, um, I think it's important that we um, as people of colour or we as uh, people, who, even myself, I have a level of privilege over someone who is black um, and that's me as like a South Asian. Um, so just I think for all of us to try and actually get on those decision making tables um, if you know power comes at those tables, we need to actually make an active, you know, have an active stance in actually trying to form, you know, get on those tables. So you know, like I mentioned at the start about, you know, I'm kind of on lots of board groups. I'm a panel member of lots of uh, groups locally. Um, I think that's really important. Um, and taking an active role in politics as well. Uh, you know, I stood for election, and when it came to that, there wasn't a lot of, you know people who actually wanted to come and go door knocking you know I don't like door knocking uh, I don't like leafleting blah 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 um, but then those same people would be at home complaining about like the state of affairs um, so I don't think you can kind of have it both ways like if you don't like how a system is running you need to actually actively go out and change that system um, so I think you know those are you know quite important steps I've actually got about 13 steps that I've written just recently in an article if anyone wants to kind of have a look at kind of practical things that you could do so yeah one of them you know join a board group be a, a trustee or a governor. So, you know, there's lots of local schools around. I, um, or if you want a governor here, um, find out about like the company you're working for, what is their diversity and inclusion policy? Um, so a lot of the time it might be like a tick box, you know, thing, check off like the quotas, um, you know, doing something like for Black History Month, that isn't being diverse or, you know, inclusive. Um, I think that's you know that's something that's used as an excuse a lot um or as an example oh yeah we've done something for black history month or we've done something for this this you know week or whatever or we've posted a black box on social media you know for all those people posting a black box on social media if if you're only doing that and only going to a protest i think that's that's an issue like you know that that's kind of more that is that's not the end of the that's not the end of the story at all change is not going to come overnight change is not going to come with just you know posting a single black box um this is if there's you know we're talking about systemic 
institutionalized institutionalized sorry racism um and that goes far beyond like you know the other speaker said far beyond just the police um you know we're talking about authority figures we're talking about how the world is kind of set up essentially um so you know if we're looking at all of those factors it's not suddenly going to change you know overnight so it requires years of groundwork so call out you know your own organization see what their policies are uh, it could be you know your own relatives like if they if you know someone who has views that you don't agree with have you actually said anything to them um uh, uh, politics like i said you know either do campaigning stand for election yourself if you want to um support people um uh, because you know you need diverse groups of people and you need a representative body whether that's in your workplace um, I think someone mentioned before, um, Montel, around the uh, recruitment side of things. So if you can be on a recruitment panel or an interview panel, it doesn't, not just for the police, but just for anything, really. Um, you know, I've interviewed certain individuals before, and it's always a bit weird sitting on the other side, but you can see the kind of the quality of people and you can make sure that diverse groups are heard. That's saying that, you yeah. know, you're only going to select a certain um, group or set certain uh, type of people, but it's about giving um, an equal opportunity to people. Um, there's so many other things where, you know, you can actively support businesses by black people. Um, you can inform people. So like a lot of people might not actually know what stop and search scrutiny panel is. Um, they might never have heard of the gangs matrix as well. Some people here might not have heard of it. Um, so, you know, people listening that, you know, there's the Met Police have got um, this kind of database where um, people who are perceived to be gang members um, in London are kind of on this you know, database. Um, but it's disproportionately um, made up of young black men. Um, so, you know, there's a group called Stopwatch. They kind of do work around that to try and inform people if they're on, on that um, group or not. Um, and then looking at kind of the sectors that you're involved in. So for me, you know, I've, I'm involved in the education, charity and art sector. Um, in the education sector, I think if we don't learn about the history of colonialism, for example. Um, and, you know, when you look at the way history is taught, it's, uh, there's kind of campaigns that ask, why is my curriculum so white? Um, and, and look I'll at just, books on feminism and, and feminists and it's just there's so many things that need to be changed and I'll come in right there because we have a comment from uh, Amina actually from on Facebook who says that what we need is proper black history taught in schools because um, she said I used to teach and the choice from the curriculum is inadequate um, somebody else has said um, oh uh, again, about education. Education is the key. Um, we're, we're not being taught, uh, and our children are not being taught their real values in school um, because it's all kind of all one-sided. We do have a comment from Karen Eastman who says, what Denise is saying now is very true, is what Denise has said. This is a one-strand a one issue. There are layers and layers to this racism onion we are not the ones with the problem and we cannot fix it alone if there was no such thing as white supremacy the playing fields would have already been leveled because i for one would not allow inequality to continue so we see that there's inequality and i know that that um that glenn has and um glenn's going to come in and then i see denise's hand denise's going to come in after and then, um, David, did you want to come in? You're very quiet. Just raise your hand. If you raise your hand, then I'll know. Oh, no. All right, so Glenn, come in, and then we'll go to Denise and then David. Yeah, um, I mean, I 100% agree with everything Hal just said. But going back to what Denise was saying and what, what the, the person who just fed in from, from the Facebook, mm. it's 100% it's it, it's the fact, isn't it? And um, white supremacy, is, is is that's there you know it's anyone who, who seeks to deny that i think and, and the point denise makes about the power being with the majority of the people who are white is a hundred percent a responsibility that all white people should recognize it is and reparations i think that's something that should have been done so long ago you know and not just sorry in in word but sorry indeed, you know, this, it wasn't words that was, were stolen, it was lives, it was money, it was, you know, and to this day, we live with not just the, if you like, post-traumatic massive stress disorder that that causes for a whole population of people, of African Caribbean people, but there's also the, the flip side of that 
is the post-traumatic supremacy overhang with white culture, white society, white establishment particularly, right? And I think if white people, we white people, try and avoid that point and say, you know, you know when you hear say, oh, all lives matter and that kind of stuff, you know what I mean? It's kind of like people ain't getting it, you know? Throughout this period, to be honest with you, everybody here, I've been deeply inspired by the the uprising, yeah, by the by the um the vibrancy and 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 intelligent forcefulness of it all, you know. And I'm hoping and praying that that's the beginning of something which continues. And I think this is the vital question because the problem we've all got those of us who want to see change. I mean, when I, I'll tell you now, I'm a white man, right? And when I saw that statue torn down, it brought joy to my soul, man. And when they threw it in the river, even more joy to my soul. So to be a black person, I mean, I know personally Marvin, the, the mayor in, um, in Bristol. He's a friend of mine, yeah, before he was mayor. And he went on the telly and he said, look, me personally and every black person in Bristol, that's an affront every day to us. And the fact that white society in Bristol had apparently voted by 56% to keep it, you know, speaks volumes in a way. People aren't getting it. So if this is the beginning of people getting it, amen, hallelujah to that. Right? And, and I, I just want to say, you know, for white people in the current moment, it's where do you want us, right? Because this is people having their voice. And, you know, there's, you know Malcolm X with, with the sheep and the fox and that kind of angle where you know you have white spokespeople jumping up who don't know anything about being black and the experience and all that we're not seeing that we're seeing black people speaking and and acting and it's beautiful you know so this is my one thing i wanted to leave with on this point was the problem we've all got is that explosive sort of like exciting responses like this happen every so often and they're like fireworks, they go up and there's a big noise. And then when it comes back down and something else happens next week in the news, do you know what I mean? It all subsides. And I think the question, I ain't got an answer totally to this. I've got some input to a discussion about it, but the question for all of us is how do we, how do we make sure we all, the movement, make sure that that doesn't happen here? That something beyond this, this energy turns into something more permanent something more watchdoggy, so I don't know, but something more permanent. Because if this comes down as a burnt rocket, the next time we'll be here is when it happens again, when some other poor soul can't breathe because the police have got their foot and neck on a knee on his neck, you know what I mean? Powerful. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah. yeah, powerful, powerful, powerful. Today, this topic is called, I want to live. Yeah, this is what you called it. And that's what's resonating my mind. And, you know, there's, I've been using this for the past few days. You know, they want our rhythm, but they don't want our blues. Yeah, they want our rhythm, but they don't want our blues. Yeah, so let that sink in. And because that's how I feel so deeply and everything everybody's saying is great, but what we're not doing is putting it together. So I think like what we need to do is to strategize, re-strategize. We can't do these things. So we can talk about, I had a big argument with Waterstones and I will now ensure that next year, because of what I've done, that every Waterstones now will, will have, actually have a section for Black History Month, just for books alone. That I had to deal with the chief executive, dealt with that in isolation. It doesn't really take away our problems, yeah? Um, there was a book called Sociology. Um, we got that, we had that book withdrawn. It was a GCSE textbook. We've had it withdrawn because of some of the, 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 the comments about black men and black families. We had that book withdrawn. That's only a small thing. All those things are all great in isolation. We need to work with a new strategy with a different type of energy. So when we're talking about Black History Month and, and talk to your employers and, 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 you know, I was part of a stop and search group, part of that, they're all fantastic things to do. 
but they are all here we need to do this and until we do holistic we are groundhogging day again and and that really is i could just virtually end my conversation here tonight just by saying until we recognize you bear in mind we only make up two percent of this pop of the black pop of the population in the uk we make up two percent and if you think out of that two percent in terms of disproportionality take out all the young people that are on youth detention that can't do anything take out the people who are in prison yeah they can't do anything take out maybe people who are very elderly they can't do anything take out the young the young children who are not in a position because they can't vote etc etc take them out what does it leave you with so when you're operating let's say in Luton there's a great piece of work going on in Luton around a specific piece of work and then you may go up to say Bradford and they're doing something there or you go down to Bristol they are all work in isolation. So Boris Johnson says, don't worry about them, darlings. They're all working in isolation. They have no power, yeah? Until we decide to work together and then go and knock on his door. He has no fear. He has no fear. No government's got no fear of us at all. Not even this much have they got any fear. Because guess what? We are not, as we, Black Lives Matter, black people, whoever's listening to this Facebook, yeah? We need to, you need to, we need to get our act together and stop what we call a long talk because we've been talking for far too long. Yeah. It's just long. Yeah. Stop the long talk. Yeah. And find the energy and the courage. I spoke to some people at a radio station. I've got to be careful. I not to say, but it was in Ireland and it was in Northern Ireland. And they said to me, you know what? We obviously, because of the troubles, we had to go through lots of things and they lost lives, yeah, for a fight, yeah, because it was something they strongly believed in. They're not advocating violence, but what they're saying and disruption, they're saying to me, Denise, talk to your people, yeah, you need to fix up because you keep doing little softly, softly talking. We're not saying to go out there and kill and shoot, I'm not saying that. But if you don't, if you stop, if you don't, if you keep doing the softly, softly talk, we're going to be here in 10 years time. So when your grandson, Yvonne, is 14, he said, Granny, Yvonne, what, what did you do? Yeah. What did we do? Yeah. So you are an important medium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Important medium. I shared your meeting tonight with lots of people. Yeah. You're an important medium. And anywhere we can get an opportunity to speak, yeah take it yes we should take it take the opportunity yeah to talk the talk find the courage yeah don't be scared because we unfortunately because of years of the whole like you know be careful how you approach those people you might you don't want to upset them we have to upset them yeah we can't do that little talky talk and so when you're talking Montel about the about Luton, I will show you. This is mine for Derby City Council. These are my workforce statistics. Get Lutons, get them, and do what I've done and the process of doing. Query the data in this particular document, yeah? Because if we don't have power, we haven't got power in employment, we're not in the senior leadership teams, yeah? We have got um, there's clear disparity in terms of salaries. Every local authority has one of these. I have challenged the qualitative and quantitative data and they are shaking in their boots right now. Yeah, they're, they're not looking forward to post-COVID because they're not saying I'm coming for them. Yeah, every local authority get your data. Yeah, but what we need to do is we need to get it together. Can't, this is great, but we need to come together, together. as one group. That's Absolutely. what I'm saying. Absolutely. I, I have to agree. And you know, Denise, I was just about, I was going to say, boom, you, I was just about to ask, are the leaders, because I see lots of people saying lots of different things all over social media. And my one question was, are the leaders connecting together to create one big force? Because individually, we have a little bit of power. But when we come together, that's when the force becomes unshakable and we have to nowadays we've seen this i'm just going to say this this the whole situation is not the first time even george floyd it's not the first time we've yeah. heard a man say i can't breathe it's yeah. not the first time right we saw that 
with, with um, that happened four years ago. Another American man was saying, I can't breathe. How many more times are we going to hear the same thing? And are we going to wait in the UK? I'm just going to ask you, are we going to wait until it's one of our children? So now this is why I'm saying, Denise, it's a hit the nail on the head. We have to come together and we have to start asking the right questions. We are a force. And if we come together, then there, there is, things will have to change. How? How are, we going to, how are we going to come together? May the 9th in Lewisham, a woman was, I thought it was, you may have all seen it. I thought it was a man that six police officers were grappling with. Yeah. Uh -huh. I thought it was. And then, and then I, I heard the woman say, she's the first person of recent. She said, I can't breathe. Do you remember? No, I, I haven't seen it. Breathe. I haven't heard it. I, haven't I will it. send it to you later. I thought, Thank you. I can't breathe. And I said, okay. Um, then I thought maybe I'm, I'm mishearing. And then I heard a woman say, suppose she's pregnant six police officers what? this is may the 9th it was in the metro it's not no like you know it's not no like it's a fact yeah and the bbc didn't want me to talk about it yeah well i'm going to talk about it whatever that woman did there was no reason for that to happen you understand mm -hmm. so talking to me yeah about this is all good i want to know i'd like us to talk about if it's strategy that we need what are we going to do? How are we going to pull it together? Who's doing it? How? David. Put your mic on, David. Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay. <clears throat> First thing I'd like to do is to acknowledge the level of awareness, the protests around the country, London, Luton, Derby, Bristol, the impact and the um, diversity of the nature of people protesting. So it was about Black Lives Matter, but it was multiracial, a range. And I, I don't know how we analyzed, but from how I've assessed it, it has raised a level of sensitivity and self-questioning from radio presenters, broadcasters, journalists in their response to what's happened. So that's the first thing I would like to acknowledge and I don't think it will be just another one of those protests but as we said at the beginning is what do we do going forward? Mm -hmm. I heard what Denise said about the power structures, and that's true, but I think there's a lot we can do, and Denise has touched upon it, Halima's touched upon it, um, Sarah's touched upon it, and Montel. Joining, wiring things up, identifying how we can have <coughs> coalitions, you know, a town or city or local neighborhood, we have to identify <clears throat> what each other can contribute. To, tonight is a good example of the range of um, knowledge, experience, skills and expertise of everybody who's involved on the panel and the people who are listening. So it's about joining forces and coalitions. That is doable, we can do it, and we have to make it happen. Going forward, one of the things we have to change, I noticed it, and it's something we have to change in all our <clears throat> organizations, institutions, and I have witnessed, for example, many of the town halls around the country had purple light as a gesture to say that they cared. 
many police services put out statements, many chief constables, council leaders, my own, <clears throat> my own executive mayor in Lewisham where I was a Labour councillor, a Labour executive mayor. <clears throat> and I have, using soft power, kind of nudge that to say, <clears throat> putting on a purple light in the town hall, for me, doesn't begin to reflect an organization or someone in a position of power and influence, demonstrating how they show that Black Lives Matter. How you show Black Lives Matter is you take, sorry, you take stock of your own organization and you look at your system structures processes and procedures and you evaluate how you are treating your own black colleagues members of staff in the uh, on the local authorities your cabinet members your council of colleagues those that is a meaningful way and also acknowledging in your organization where you have black people so for me, it is really a matter of concern whether a chief police officer or an executive mayor or a council leader or a member of parliament puts out a statement, yes, Black Lives Matter, but you make no reference in your community, in your town, as to the black people who have already contributed significantly and those colleagues that you're working with, those black colleagues who are on your team, you put out a statement, Black Lives Matter, but you make no acknowledgement of them. So going forward, <clears throat> and I'm one of these people, I did it inside the police service. I spoke openly in 1995 at the Commonwealth Institute in London. I spoke about racism being endemic in the Metropolitan Police. I wrote in many police journals about police racism <clears throat> and the fact that Association of Chief Police Officers, Chief Constables need to move to the next step to acknowledge police racism and start doing something meaningful about it. I asked for an inquiry by a judge like Scarman or Stephen Tumim that did the inquiries in prisons about police racism. I didn't get it in isolation. We got the Stephen Lawrence public inquiry, which did exactly what I was asking for as someone in the, in the police service. So all of us have, as I say, we have different strengths, abilities, capabilities. So those of us who can, it doesn't matter how impenetrable the power structures appear to be, we can. And if, as I say, one of the reasons I think it's helpful to have people in the institutions, in all of them, like Sarah as a member of parliament, other people, uh, um, Montel working with all the structures with local authorities and police, is that we have to make an impact from within. Protest outside are good, and as we can see, they play their part. But for me, when I'm inside the police service as an operational detective inspector, I am saying racism is endemic, and we need to do something. Commissioner, Chief Constable, Chief Superintendent, let's do something. So, Let's get beyond, <clears throat> let's get beyond those symbolic gestures and do meaningful things. If Black Lives Matter, then let us show wherever the council is, Luton Council, Lewisham Council, then council leaders show me that you are acknowledging the black, your black colleagues, your black members of staff, and they matter. You're not making an empty, or just a gesture. You're actually showing 
that you have black people in your organization. You've had black people who've sacrificed and made a lot of contributions in your borough or your town or your city. Let us hear you acknowledging them without making a general vague, you know, putting on the lights in the town hall or making a statement with your constabulary logo. You have black, so that's, that's one of the start, starting points. So we have to examine our own organizations, systems, structures, processes, procedures. And for people like Sarah and myself in the Labour Party, it has so many multi-layered structures. We have to unpick and unpack all of them and see where, where we're going with that. Brilliant. Thank you for that, David. Just before... Sorry, thank you. <laughs> I have a lot, I have a lot more to say, but, 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 Halima, but Halima said some of it. We have to get involved in being school governors, magistrates, police and crime commissioners, and all the community police engagement uh, groups that there are. We have some people may say they're not interested in politics, but for example, in my, in my old borough in Lewisham, some of the schools are 90 or more percent of black children. In many, in politics, it's about the numbers. Where we have the numbers, and even in the Labour Party I belong to, in many places we have, as black people, we have the numbers, we go out and vote. We vote for our councillors, whatever, but we don't use that to, to take the power that we can mm. with, with the numbers. And the last thing before I give other people a thing, Sarah's uh, participating, she said it. What we need to do is also we make sure we use our investments to petition our councillors, petition our council leader and our council, um, put public questions to our council leaders and that, but also our member of parliament, we can communicate with them in so many ways. They have surgeries, you can write to them, you can email them, and we have to use, we, that's our investment. Make our members of parliament earn every penny that they get. Make, know your ward councillors, how many of all the people listening, whatever, who are your ward councillors? They volunteered to come and serve us. Let them, let them serve us to full capacity. So I think there's a lot. Yes, there are, there are blockages. We know what the power structures are, but I think there's a lot in our hands that we can do to unblock in institutional racism and individual racism in, in, in our lives. Yeah. Yvonne, can I come in? Hold on, because Sarah's coming in and then, yeah. and then you can come in. But one of the things I just want to, and I just want to throw it out there, and it might just be like a bit of a grenade to you. But in my thinking, we've got this issue that we see in people die in, in police custody and in other words. Why are we not looking to get the laws changed to how they actually handle people? What you know, if we have all these different things, that, you know, people go through different things. We've got Sarah, not Sarah's law, Anne's law, this law, that law. So why is it that we're seeing people die in police custody? And I just want to throw this out there. So why is it that we're not making the law change because we are the people and they yeah, make the I'm... laws for the people? So I'm just throwing that out there um, for you and then you guys can come back and talk. Well, be before, before Sarah comes back, and I'll just like to say very quickly, we do, unlike the states, obviously they've been moved now in, in Minnesota and some of these other states, they've actually banned the chokeholds. And we've, we've done that in many instances in the UK. So, so there is the, the ability to influence. In 2012, not long after the 2011 riots, a police officer racially abused a young black man in the back of a police van. Thankfully, he, he taped it all on his, on his mobile phone. Really abusing, uh, uh, excess use of force, uh, naked, 
the, the hardcore racist language. After that, I said, I, I started off a Facebook group and a campaign that there was a gap. We, we had um, CCTV in custody suites. We have CCTV in cell passages. And I said we needed body cams and dash cams on police officers having interaction with the members of public. Thankfully, the then commissioner of the Metropolitan Police very quickly, Bernard Hogan Ho, he said, yes, I'm up for um, police officers wearing body cams. He missed, not long after that, he started trial practices and it's quite universal now. So if, I, I think one of the things is, one of the things I try to do, I'm, I, am, I will never defend the indefensible and I will always tell the truth about racism, police, um, excessive use of force, whatever it is. But I always try to look for solutions. So rather than just being up in arms, this young man was racially abused, excessive force was used. I then actually laid out, well, these are the gaps. And thankfully they were picked up and acted on. So we, we can do that. Right. Sarah, do you want to come in? Yeah, I think that it's not just necessarily a problem about what laws are being passed, it's how the laws and the legislation are actually enforced. Yeah, and which laws work for certain people, ultimately. And I think we need to have a much tougher stance and a review of how these laws are enforced. Um, because as we've seen even recently, laws aren't enforced um, universally. And they, they're not, they're not um, fairly applicable to everybody. And when that is found to be the case, there needs to be much tougher reparations for the people that we should be trusting to protect us. Um, one of the things that I wanted to come on, which was about what Denise, how, and David were saying, is how you, how you move this forward, how you combine, how you combine forces. I come from a trade union background, organising is my bread and butter and one of the the things that we keep talking about institutions is if we don't have people already in them they are also workplaces and one of the best places to start is to say this is my power this is my work this is my labor and i can take it away in terms of striking but also organizing within those those institutions um, as employees and it is about bringing people together and i have to say when I was working in the trade union movement, um, it was predominantly male, predominantly white. Um, um, when I was working with black sections, it was the same people. And there were very few young black faces in there as well. Um, and the, I have the problem with, same problem with my own community, trying to get East Asians involved in politics and getting them involved in workplace organisation in the trade union, particularly where you can really affect change in terms of terms and conditions, in pay, um, in, in the structural racisms that you see as well within institutions and within workplaces in particular. It's a huge um, lever of power that we can have and we can have pretty immediately. Uh, but I think it is something that we can learn from the trade union movement in terms of the level of, level of bringing people together and that organizing for one aim. Can I come in? Wrong? Sorry, I was on me? mute. Yeah, I was muted and tried to unmute myself. Yeah, go, go for it, Montel. So first of all, I totally agree. It's not really the fact that we need the laws to be changed. There's enough laws on the statute for what my experience is, and I, again, I do training on laws with our police officers, is how they are used and how they are interpreted. That is the problem. And they are done in a way which clearly is biased, clearly and openly that's been recognized. Um, secondly, um, right to say that body-worn videos and cameras are everywhere, but very few places mandate officers to look at them and even if they do wear them and they do record they're not always looked at apart from here in Bedfordshire we try and do our sample at least 
10%. We are behind because of COVID, but it's the only, only county in the United Kingdom, the only, and we were the first in the United Kingdom that's got ordinary people, including obviously David and the other members of the panel, who can look at real body one videos and hold police to account and refer them if, in the opinion of the panel, they think the officer is abusing their power. Um, I'd just like to talk about when it was mentioned about numbers. We are only about um, 25 to 30,000 people in Luton. Luton has got roughly 220,000 people. We would never win on our own. There's far too few of us. Um, now feels different with Black Lives Matter. Everybody's got the, the um, banners or the young people, etc. In June 2020, I've been doing this for nearly 20 years. Even last year, I was regarded as a radical last year for using comments such as Black Lives Matter. With many committees and boards, which Luton Borough Council have in partnership with many organisations, which I sit in as the only black person and constantly, repeatedly, one hand goes up, everybody else votes against. Repeatedly, even up to 2019. I've sent emails to people in Luton Borough Council who are a great partner and they do some good things. But it's only recently they're beginning to wake up. And now, because the majority of people believe and recognise that fairness and equality is important and black lives do matter, that now in June 2020, it feels different. It didn't feel different up until last year. A few people have mentioned and talked about what's the outcome, what's the takeaway from these conversations. And I think it's really important to highlight, um, it's been covered by my colleagues, the other speakers. There are a number of very important institutions and organizations that affect and control your lives and our lives. Get on those boards and if you can't yourself, find out who is and who can and work with them to affect change. Remember that we cannot do this on our own. Those bodyguards, governmental, both local, local government and central government, policing, not just the police, but the whole police family, businesses, businesses um, control our lives in a huge way and they have loads of strategies around corporate social responsibility and they bend and change for the customers and for their employees. Health organisations, Luton, um, Luton and Dunstable Hospital and all the dental surgeries have residents and community boards to influence how they work, coordinated by a body called Health Watch. It was mentioned by previous our colleague, get onto school and college and university governing bodies. They control expenditure. You can look at the detail of student attainment and ask questions. The other thing which is really important is the media. When all this fails, because sometimes it will fail, persevere and use the media. Programs like yours, use local newspapers as well to highlight inequalities and point out those people, call out those people who do discriminate. Now, when I've done it in the past, people say, oh, you're always complaining, but you must always stick to the course and continue to be informed if that's what it takes. Absolutely. Here, here. Go on, Glenn. Oh, come in, Glenn. Do you want to respond? <clears throat> yeah. I'm not saying I, I disagree with anything anybody said at all. I, I, I agree with everything that's being said. But I've got a, a cat for the pigeons, if you like, right? which is, and I'd feel remiss if I didn't say this, right? because most people I move with will be thinking this, right? Is that it's, it's one thing saying, let's occupy the seats of power more in order that we can have more influence right but the system itself has a horrible habit of dragging people into it and it changes them rather than then they change it and people feel that on a ground level on a street level big time right 
they have a trust problem with with good cause a lot of the time. And what I'm saying is right, that in terms of being in position, I don't look, for example, at the fact Leon Briggs, when Leon Briggs died in that police station, if we'd got justice for Leon, in other words, if people had been charged, etc., as we all feel he was killed, he would have been the first one out of thousands in the last 25 years who have died in police custody or prison custody or whatever in the UK. Thousands have died and never yet has there been a conviction, bang, prison, away you go. No one knows of one. So let's be real about the system. Let's be real and not think, well, if we can just jump in there, that alone will do it. It needs something else. And it goes back to what we were talking about before, about how do we continue not let this firework stay alight, not let it go out. Because the only thing they listen to, the only thing, you know, democracy's never been handed on a plate. It's always been through popular pressure. Yeah. And the only thing they listen to, Bob Marley said it, collective security for surety. When there's lots of us, they care. When it, it's on the agenda and it's high, it goes on the telly, they care. But when it goes to sleep, it goes back to them caring about something else. And that's the reality, yeah? So I needed to say that because I'm feeling like, while I agree with all that's being said, we can't just say, well, let's have more seats of power that are with people of colour. Because remember when Barack Obama was president, the amount of black people evicted, the amount of black, matters, black Lives Matter was set up when Barack Obama was president. Do you know what I mean? And he would tell you in private, I'm sure, that the forces against change with from within are so powerful, right, that it needs external, we, the community, mobilising. I mean, I, just let me say this, yeah, Exodus, I said to you, lasted eight years of every two weeks mobilising with injunctions, with police, with magistrates, couldn't stop it because of the unity amongst the community. And that's what it needs. It's going to need this big rush of energy that people are feeling to be to be permanentized somehow. Somehow. Because I, I'm telling you, I have no confidence in a system, whoever's in it, I have no confidence in a system that fundamentally it fails every time to treat police when police someone dies. Police don't even get don't even get arrested straight away in interview. Well, you would, but they don't. There's, you know, so there's fundamental change needed, not just a few more people with the same rules of the game. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you so much. I do know that um, Sarah has to go now. She's got baby to feed. So um, I want to say thank you for Sarah for joining. And actually, you, I know that you've gone way over what you said that you were able to do. So I do really appreciate your input and the fact that you came on board. So thank you very much. And I will be in touch with you soon. That's okay. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I hope to see you face to face properly again once this is all over and it allows us to. Yes. Um, but as it is, I've got to go and uh, I've got my number one boss. She's, uh, she's crying out for some food. So I better go feed her. Okay, my darling. Okay. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Right, so just just to to to, um, to just come in on on what what Glenn Glenn said, I I do um, I agree uh, with what Glenn has said totally. And one of the reasons why I threw out the law, the thing it was actually a question that was uh, that was sent in earlier, is because what is being seen is that. People are killed and, and things, like, but the police are only um, brought to some kind of justice if there is a complaint from the people. Because in, in the, with, with Leon Briggs, if we go back, you know, the night vigils was outside the police station. And so things were moved on because we, we protested but it shouldn't have to come to that. Black lives do matter. And if they do matter, then instantly they should be arrested. Instantly. 
instantly and it isn't so there is one law for us and there is another law for the system so and that is why that question was thrown out um in into the public so again i'm just gonna um th if you anyone wants to come in and respond or, or take the conversation halima wants to come in unmute yourself and and come in with uh with what you want to say and then david will come in after I can see a hand up um so i just wanted to okay um so yeah i just wanted to respond to what glenn said um so it's not that i'm disagreeing completely but it's just um that kind of idea where you know if you kind of get into the world of politics or have a position you know leadership or power that it will essentially corrupt you um or that you won't kind of stand by your morals and so on um i think a lot of the time that's kind of used to sort of deter people from trying in the first place um so even kind of like when i stood for election it was oh um you know how you're going to kind of stick by your principles and and um oh it's a dog eat things that kind of get thrown at you um and it's for like it's people trying to kind of undermine you and stop you kind of actually trying in the first place so i think we need to kind of have that fine balance of um you know making us aware that you know it's not an easy world um it's not going to be kind of an easy path at all but still try but also kind of sticking with your own intentions your own morals um your own principles um and you know obviously there, there's going to be kind of people who you know we might have seen in the past who didn't uh, the cause essentially um but that doesn't mean that you know we don't try so i think it you know it is important that we do kind of sit in those tables sit in those decision making tables um to to get some kind of change and we're talking about collective change here um if there's only that one person trying to do it it's it's not it's not going to work you know you need you need a lot of people um and the other thing i want to actually say was um i think something that denise mentioned right right near the start about uh, being asked to appear on like lots of talks and you know lots of events and you know to talk about this issue because it's a heightened issue at the moment um she's being asked by lots of people to actually um speak and i you also mentioned about how you kind of um said no to some people as well um so on that matter i think it's about knowing your worth um you know i think someone else mentioned about um people you know you've got organizations uh, they have Um, funding for certain things like you know when it comes to diversity and inclusion you know they'll have con consultants for certain things but if it was let's say some black history month for example and they, they call um, Yvonne or they call Denise and like oh can I get your advice or I'm going to do something that's going to look good on your uh, especially for some you know youth worker for young people as well they're like oh it's going to look good on your CV um, it's uh, going to kind of boost your profile it's going to give you recognition Mm -hmm. um, and then you find out oh wait they paid um a white consultant might have been hundreds of pounds so you know 500 pounds for a workshop day and then that young person who's black who happens to be black um was paid nothing um and they did it for recognition or for the cv um so i think that's important about knowing your worth um and especially as young person you know i'm only 26 um, and I've, I've had it done to me so many times um, I've had my student had, had had it happen to my students lots of times um, where you know we want to you know we're passionate about certain issues and we want to kind of say certain things um, but then you know it's about people using and abusing you um, and not giving you what what you're worth essentially um, so hire out your time as a consultant do you know ask what their budget is for a certain event you know if you're being asked to be a speaker um, and actually you know if if you if people are saying black lives matter why does it only matter if you know someone died essentially um, or somebody was murdered or you know if something horrific happened why does it not matter just you know, on a day-to-day -day basis um, and also when it comes to those speaking events why is it that you're only speaking about racism um, why are you only speaking about you know, a murder uh, or about gangs or numbers or the you know, artists musicians you know there's so many things that you could be talking about so it's about that as well just recognizing you know what the person not just the race so yeah if uh, i could throw it out to anyone else have you finished can i come in
Yeah. Yvonne, can yeah. you hear that? Yeah. Yeah, come in. I think Glenn wanted to come in, but so come in. I did come in. agree with those last comments. Um, there is something which I regularly, every single year, raise with Littenborough Council. We constantly bring in people, mainly from London and outside, to do um, things in Luton. Whereby we got lots of local people who are very capable of doing that. Hundred percent agree with that. That's a problem, and it doesn't change. We're 2020. I've been raising this issue, as Glenn will tell you, from the mid-2000s, more than 15 years. Um, there's another comment which I, again, totally I would agree with. Um, Glenn is right that, yeah, you do need to push from the outside, but you do need to help influence from those decision-making tables. Because around those tables, they are deciding who gets employed, um, where the money goes to, what organisations get a particular contract. Absolutely, shout from the outside because you help if you've got a double um, pronged attack, but you can't just do one. And remember your allies, you cannot do it alone. Brilliant. David, come in. Thanks for that, Montel. Oh, thanks for that, Montel. Your phone, David, you're, on mute. you're on mute. You're on mute, David. How did that happen? That's it. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so Glenn and everybody else, listening can i be very clear i nothing i said was suggesting that grassroots organizing community activists don't have a big part to play absolutely all of us at all levels have a big contribution to make to to impact change also i am not denying that some people in the structures are socialized but I've given you my own testimony. I've given you my testimony and you can go online and put in the search engine, Detective Inspector David Michael or David Michael, police racism. And you can see within, whilst I was serving, there are many times in a professional way, I was able to go on the BBC News, Sky News, and basically contradict my bosses at Scotland Yard in an appropriate and professional way. And the Black Police Association gave evidence to the Stephen Lawrence inquiry that is serving police officers in the same organization, basically giving evidence for the Lawrence family against the Metropolitan Police. I personally never worked on the Stephen Lawrence murder investigation, but I wrote a statement of my own of my own volition to put into the inquiry to make sure things that I knew in terms of organizational behavior and specific information to such an extent that the Lawrence family welcomed me to sit in their space whenever I went to that inquiry. There are many, there are some people who get socialized into the organizations. There are some people who stand up for what is true and what is right. And there are many of those people. And since I moved on and the people that succeeded me in the Black Police Association, people would have seen many of them on the 10 o'clock news, the nine o'clock news, <coughs> in public meetings, carrying on the work that those of us who were the early pioneers have started. So it is, possible I, as i say now i'm in, i'm in a political party i am not just watching my uh, the people who have power in my political party either make gestures or say things i do it openly on social media i challenge so we don't we don't just fall into line there there are many of us who look at the greater good who, who have experienced racism, who see racism daily, and who are willing to stand up and to give those young people, those young people who were out on the streets in a difficult time, at a time of a, a virus pandemic, were willing to take the risk because they said the virus of racism is more important and they're willing to take certain personal risks to go and make their voices heard. 
Yeah, David, um, I, just to be clear, yeah, I in no way was, I, I, in fact, I started by saying that I didn't disagree with anything anybody had said. Yep, yep, I you did say that. People of you in positions like you're in, I think Montel, I said to you, in it, Montel, man? I mean, keep your eye on their asses, man, because it's good to have that. We're the only ones in the UK I've got on Montel. So I'm all for that, right? But what I'm saying is, as much as good a guy as you might be, and I'm sure you are, right? No one ever has been charged for deaths in custody and convicted out of thousands, David. And that was through your time before and after. If you go to America, it's the same way virtually, because there's, an, it, there's a systematic defense of policemen, because some would argue, yeah, who's Romans, I call them, in the system, they would say, look, mate, you can't have, have expect someone to go out and wrestle criminals to the ground and treat them the same as someone who's, do you see what I mean? They, so they kind of self-protect. And, and that's what I'm talking about, institutional. There's a definiteness, David. You know, if you're killed by a copper, there ain't going to be no justice. You know this, unless you was a fool. Now look, John Charles de Menezes was shot on the tube. Ian Tomlinson was killed on the telly. They, everyone saw it. And still, when there's cameras there, no one's getting done for that. And that was Keir Starmer from the Labour... I'm in the Labour Party too. That was Keir Starmer as a Department of P DPP, civil rights lawyer. But some people in the establishment care more about the law than justice. They're two different things. Because remember, slavery was legal. Apartheid was legal. So the law is a different thing altogether to justice. And... We, until we get down to these root cause issues, we're not going to crack nothing. That's my, so I didn't mean in any way, Halima, to say at all. I'm, I love the fact you're involved in getting, getting faces in there that, that know what life's about. But what I did mean was that an active community, not just <coughs> when the fireworks up, but generally, will keep elected representatives on their toes. A regular people's assembly that they had to, would keep them on their toes. So that's what I'm arguing for, a, a permanentization of the mass gathering so that there's accountability, etc. Not a criticism of any person, or person here or anywhere else about being involved. It is, as you say, the two together that will do it. Yeah. Y Yvonne, can I just have one last word, please? Can I have one last word? Yes, you can. Yeah. Absolutely, okay. yes. Yeah. Just to come back to the point that uh, Glenn has raised. Yet yeah, you can't deny <clears throat> um, the look of things in terms of convictions for deaths in police custody. But one of the jobs I did in the police service, I worked in the uh, what they now call professional standards department. And uh, one of the things even I was pleasantly surprised about when I went to work there was the police officers that rang up, that phoned up about the misconduct of other colleagues. And there have been many cases um, that unlike what we saw with uh, George Floyd in the States, where police officers intervene and police officers do ring up professional standards when their colleagues either commit criminal activity or other forms of misconduct. So that does happen in the system. And I, um, as I say, I'm not here to defend the indefensible, but the, all those high profile deaths in police custody inquests you have the people I call cause lawyers who really care. They're not just going through the motions. So they have all the resources they can to represent the families or the deceased person. And uh, we can't argue with what the outcomes are. But as I say, if, if there's something that goes before a jury, 
the jury have to listen to the evidence, they have to listen to the prosecution, defense, and the judge um, telling them what the laws is, and then they have to come to their conclusion. So uh, obviously I understand what the look is, and I'm not here to defend anyone. I and I do believe everyone, every police officer should be accountable, and that's why I had no problems working in a department where I sometimes had to search police officers' home addresses, search their lockers at work, take them to magistrate's court, take them to Crown Court and the Central Criminal Court. But after I've done that bit, it's up to the jury and the court to come to a determination. And I don't dispute the records are there as to what the determinations are. So, okay. So my, my experience um, was obviously from the Stephen Lawrence campaign before I left the country, because I actually left the country. Um, not for that reason, but it, it had a serious impact on my life and the way I saw things. And um, I, my, my big problem has, has always been... <clears throat> I, I received the MacPherson report. I was actually living in the Caribbean. I actually left the country and I was, and I remember receiving it through the post and, um, and I read it and um, I came back to England, obviously, eventually came back to the UK. And over the years, my big problem has always been how relevant is the MacPherson report today? How relevant is it? And I've often looked around Dave and I, we're still struggling. My period of time as the chair for Brent Stop and Search, I, I saw so many things that were so unresolved. Um, and I, I've always had problems with, with that. I, I, I feel also with the police, I don't know what Montel thinks, but I still, I still feel to a point that they, the scrutiny groups do fantastic work, but I still feel in so many respects that we are at Groundhog Day. I still feel that way. I don't feel that the distance traveled is sufficient because I still see far too many, know of too many of our young black men in particular, yeah, that are victims of this awful system. And then I look at the prison, goodness me, the prison statistics, yeah, are still so high. I hate that word disproportionality, but it's become like a fact of our life. Hence why I will go back to the same thing again. The police cannot be dealt with in isolation. We have to pull this together. We need a new strategy. And I swear, I can't, until that happens, until we get a new strategy, Ivan, your grandson will be 28 and he'll be still saying, Granny, what did you do? I'm sorry. And that me I said to you. So the fact that you'd be calling me granny is, is, is distressing enough as it is. Uh, I'm a Mimi. <laughs> I'm not granny. I'm too young. <laughs> anyway, that's beside the point. But I, I do hear what Denise is saying. I, I, I feel this show is, is a show. We like to find solutions. And I know that we are not going to find the solution in two hours. But I think this is a start and it's a start of I'm picking, but it, there is just so much to this. There are just so many different facets of the issues around racism. It's not just one thing. It's, as somebody said, it's like an onion, but this is the biggest onion I've ever come across in my life. And with this onion, you know what happens with onions? When you start to cut into the onions, you start crying. Right? So tears. So many a tear has fallen already and many a tear is going to fall in order to make this thing change and stick. Now, the one thing I do know, that's, this is the one thing I know for sure, that if you do the same thing over and over again, you can only expect the same result. So we have to do something different to bring about a change for this. So yes, we've had the protesting, yes, and it has its place, but there is more that we have to do. And we have to do this differently because we've been protesting 
for decades, right? And there has been change, but very significant change in certain times. But it's been a long time since there has been proper change that's made a significant difference. Now is the time, I believe, that the change is going to happen, but it's up to us. And as we said in the beginning, Denise touched on it, we've all touched on it, it is about the camaraderie, it is about us coming together, and it is about us all taking our place. There are different things that we all have to do, but we have to play to our strengths. So whereas Montel is doing the stop and search and he's doing the scrutiny, that's his strength. And so he has to, you know, be, I don't know, uh, the word aggressive doesn't come across very well, but it's the only word that I can think of right now that, that gives the, the, the feeling of what I'm trying to say. So it's like you become more aggressive in your field. So you're, you are, you're relentless at what you're doing. My, um, David is in the Labour Party and Sarah, you then become relentless in your area. Halima becomes relentless in her area and, and Glenn is relentless in his and Denise is relentless in hers and I'm relentless in mine. But at the same time when we're doing all these things individually, we have to come together because that is where the power is, as far as I'm concerned. When we come together, we become a force. We don't just, we, when I put my voice, right? This is something that I always say. If I put, if I'm just insane shouting out my voice and saying black lives matter, you hear one person's voice. But if Glenn puts his voice with my voice and Montel puts his voice with our voices and we all, that voice then creates an echo. And that echo, it, ch it changes the vibration of the energy fields that, we're, that are around us. And that's when change happens, yeah? So I'm just saying, because we've come to the end of the show, that we have to come together, whether, we, whether we're white, whether we're black, whether we're Asian, with pink and green spots, it doesn't matter how we come, we have to come into some kind of agreement and we've got to work together. But the black community, let me just say this to you, Above all, above all, above all, I've said it three times, we must come together and support each other wholeheartedly. And it's not about, oh, she's doing or he's doing this over there. No, 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 no. It doesn't matter. We come together. We have camaraderie. We are one. We are one people in a struggle. And if we come as one, the power of one, you know, because we're all of the same mind and nothing changes unless this changes first. I want to thank you all for coming on the show. Next week, we are, we are continuing this and we are talking about how in the, within the black community, how we stop internal uh, discrimination against ourselves. And we know that it exists. We need to stop it. So we are going to talk about this. I will invite you guys back on another show in a couple of weeks' time. And it's because I want us to move forward. I want some solutions. And I know, again, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's really important that we find solutions, that we work together. Now, I'm going to give you all two minutes <laughs> each, because we are over time, but it's fine. Two minutes to end and say your piece. Um, Hallie, help. I keep calling you Hallie for some. Uh, Halima, do you want to come in first, my darling? You have to unmute yourself. Oh, and just to say, that paper that you said that you'd written, if you want to send it out, you can send it out on my network as well. If you want to do that, that would be fine as well. Just to say. Oh, that'd be, that'd be great. Thank you. That'd be great. Um, yeah, so because I'd written like, you know, quite a few points about practical steps that people could take. Mm -hmm. like, uh, like I've already mentioned, you know, try to get on the board groups, uh, try to actually make a change within your own organisation. So that could be seeing what the diversity and inclusion policy is. That could be, you know, actually calling them out on their policies um, and trying to actually change those structures in your own workplace first. Try to change um, what you're kind of seeing within your own families, within your friends. Um, try to have that kind of mind shift change as well. 
um, and then you know get on those um, do something you know just out, outside of kind of the norm so if it's you know going after work to another meeting um, take out the time to actually be able to do that um, so it's not just like an overnight kind of quick fix solution um, and think about like the sector that you work in um, or you know that industry is there something specific that they can actually do so like I mentioned with myself you know in the education sector learning about the colonialism you know learning about the history that's kind of just completely missed out um, in in the school curriculum mm -hmm. um, that needs to be highlighted you know I work in the art sector as well how many times do we see where you know an artwork is seen as exotic um, mm -hmm. or one of the artifacts you know where are these so-called artifacts in museums where did they actually come from uh, no you know it shouldn't just be kind of glamorized in that sense and seen as something exotic when you know if we actually look at the roots of it it's quite troubling um so kind of think about that and then you know in the charity sector not calling each other you know saying that we are from hard to reach communities i'm sure a lot of you've heard, kind of heard that before why not look at why the organizations are hard to reach themselves um so there's lots and lots of things that we could do so from just something simple as changing our language not calling a community like a black community uh, as a hard to reach community uh, um and then the, the way the things that we do by you know getting involved in politics and actually contacting your politician you know we had sarah owen here earlier um so whoever lives in luton north they can contact the mp um and so you know make those meaningful changes but make sure those changes um are long-lasting changes um so it's not going to be an overnight fix you know just it, you know as a, as a young person um it's it, there's that kind of that okay we can just do social media and that's the end of the matter it's not the end of the matter this needs to be kind of sustained and you know as you. someone you know people of my generation that's um we keep miss we keep so, you keep dropping you know, out together H Halima, um, you uniting sorry Halima, you keep dropping out uh, so we're only getting bits and yeah, pieces. Yeah, it keeps saying my connections. It keeps saying my connections lost. Sorry. No worries. So what you can do, Halima, is send that document and I then we'll the, put it out. The and then quite people, can, people can uh, um, glean onto that and have a look at that. But I want to thank you for being here this evening. I'm going to go to David. David, you. have you got? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, just my final words is if we just focus on what we said we came for. So obviously we we were here to applaud and celebrate our many young people that went out on the protest marches and i think they achieved significantly but if we can just focus on what we said at the beginning what are we doing going forward mm. what are the solutions so let's please hang on to that yeah let's let us make those contacts and networks so to go forward there's a, a, a number of us on this panel tonight there's people listening, following. Let us make, identify people in our neighborhoods, in our towns, wherever we are. Let us make those networks and contacts and identify each other's strengths and work to each other's strengths and say, wherever we are, let us begin. Let's start here. And let us not get, we, know, we can't forget we can't forget past tragedies. We can't forget past blockages in the system, but let's not let those blockages hamper us from saying what we said tonight. How are we gonna move forward? So okay. let's please connect, network, and agree how we're gonna move forward, but don't let those past things trap us in one place. Let us actually network, contact, and move forward purposefully. Thank you, Thank David. You. Thank you so much. And like I say, I oh, will be in touch again. We will do this again to update, to see where we are, because it, you know, we are in early days with protests are everywhere at the moment. And so, you know, after protests, in my experience of, of being involved with, with Leon Briggs, after, after a certain time, like Glenn was saying, the fireworks have gone out and then it's just like, <laughs> we're not doing anything. So, in a, in, you know, I'll give it a few weeks and we'll come back and have this conversation again. Montel, thank you so much, David, for coming in. Montel, do, do you want to give your last few words before we end the show? Yeah, um, just um, when you start your journey, remember, you will be disappointed along that pathway, 
but be prepared for that at the very beginning. Be resilient, be determined, use your initiative, be adaptable, find other ways, find other people to get to your end result. Never think that you're alone. There's other people and other organizations that want the same thing that you want, but keep on going. Thank you so much. Guys, I want to thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to just bring in Glenn and then I'm going to end with Denise. So, Glenn, what are your last few words, my brother? Yeah, um, great, great discussion, really. Um, last few words are, as I said, Bob Marley, collective security for surety. It's, you know, it's now... They've just made the charges more serious in America. That wouldn't be happening at all if there weren't people on the mm -hmm. street. Yeah. You know, so it just shows again that popular pressure makes progress, you know. And um, and I wanted to end on this. Uh, Maccabee, have you heard Maccabee? He's, a, he's, a, he's an artist from the Midlands. And he tune called We've Had Enough some years ago. And it's a dynamite tune in many ways. And, you know, you know, you know, you know, like I know, a lot of um, a lot of poetic cause making and protesting is done through music, mm -hmm. and Maccabees we've had enough. Um, not only you know talks about Clinton McCurb and Cherry Gross and, and and expresses some of the rage that people need to feel, but at the end of it, he makes the point that organising is the organising is the key, and he says, "Show me a disorganised nation," and I'll, he quotes Marcus Garvey actually. And says like you know show me an organized nation you see a strong proud nation and a disorganized nation will be trampled on and that's true of a community a family a people so all you know maccabee we've had enough that's my final contribution i'm just going to go and put it on out loud and <laughs> get me the spirit. you know what i mean david yeah and upset your neighbors get your, yeah. up, man. get your bass speakers and we're on it I'll see you there. <laughs> thank you so much glenn for taking you, part ben. today. And Denise, Denise Richards. Yeah. The final so, um, so just in terms of in conclusion, that um, the things I've been talking about are actually being actioned. So I am looking to get a, a major conference, a black conference. And maybe Yvonne, you maybe want to be one of the hosts because you've already got somebody from the BBC who's prepared to host a program, a nationwide black conference, yeah, where the voices can be heard, where we're going to be talking about strategy. Ooh. So I've got two journalists of already online, and I've got a BBC person who's going to host it. And maybe you may want to be one of the hosts, Yvonne. Okay. Um, so, um, so it's good. So I don't know who's listening in, but it's one of those that you know i'm going to this i feel uh, more um infused empowered uh, to to pursue the person who's dealing with this i'm working along with him and we're going to do it it's just a simple we need a massive place yeah mm -hmm. we need a massive place where uh, the government can see that black people from north east south and west, and west have gathered in the uk yeah so we can have this talk and they can then start waking up and saying oh uh oh they're coming I do. I we thank you so much, Denise. Yeah. Thank you for the work, yeah, that you yeah. do. and thanks to every panel member for the work that you're doing in the community. It has not gone unnoticed, and I just want to say thank you and say that the support is there for you. Keep pushing, keep going forward, and let create the change. Let's be the change, and yeah. create the change that we yeah. wanna see. All right, so guys, for Facebook, uh, for those of you who are on the www. I want to thank you for listening in this evening. We will be back here tomorrow night between the hours of 10 p.m. and midnight for After Dark Conversations, Big People Thing, Big People Conversation about relationships. And the women are going to be talking about what they want or are looking for in a man. We had the men last week. Now it's the women's. And so if you've got something to say, jump on board, come in. We have, we have a Zoom panel and we run this on Facebook and uh, YouTube as well. All right, guys. So for now, this is your girl, Yvonne Michelle. I want to thank you so much.
for being here and listening into this topic. We know that it's, this is a hard one, but we're going to keep plowing it and we're going to keep working it until we see change. So for now, God bless you. Stay safe. And I will see you no, right no. here tomorrow. All right. Bye. Ciao. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Good night. Good night, guys.